My name is Courtney Colson, a female to male to female detransitioner, and on this channel we try to figure out what the hell is wrong with me. On this episode, fanfiction is turning the girls trans, which ended up being a much bigger topic than I thought it would be. However, that is not the reason I have only made one or two videos this year. But as you can see, I am cosplaying as Astarian from Baldur's Gate 3. Even though I think Gale's actually the superior choice, but I'm cosplaying as Astarian because he is so emblematic of female desire. What girls especially think of as the ideal male, what they find beautiful in men. Uh, and there's a reason why he has more fans than Gale. Well, Gale. Gale is a much more masculine, more adults. He undeniably manly man, you know? Uh, he's a huge nerd, but he's manly, physically. Whereas Astarian is more androgynous, effeminate. He is ideal for a teenage girl. He's exactly what every teenage girl wants since time immemorial. And so that brings me to my other point, is there is this paranoia that, oh, why are girls suddenly interested in just anime boys and K-pop stars and the, the, these lady boys and now they see themselves as demi-boys and where is all this coming from? Is it the birth control? This making girls want effeminate men? There's been a lot of um, fear-mongering articles about that. But no, I, I don't think this is anything new. It is simply taken on a different form. So I wish to speak to that. I'll primarily be drawing from the research and writings of Helen Joyce. She's an Irish journalist who has done a lot of good research on fan fiction and more recently connecting that to the, it being a gateway drug to transitioning. And I want to speak to that because I have much more personal experience with all of these things. You know, Helen Joyce is, I think she's mid-50s? So she's talking about it from a distance. I was on the ground. I was in the trenches. I grew up on the tumblers. I read the fan fiction, so I know all of this. I'm very familiar with it. So I want to bring my perspective, especially as a woman who did transition for a while, motivated by fan... well, not fan fiction. Fiction? Maybe fan fiction played a part. I wasn't a big reader of it, so I'll say that up front. Uh, however, maybe I should remove the teeth. So I ordered these, uh, the Scarecrow ones. They're the usually the ones. I'm not getting sponsored or anything. But yeah, I didn't realize until after I ordered them they had the small version. So, yeah. Uh, these are the large ones. Maybe I can modify them to fit more comfortably in my mouth. Hey, with a Dremel and enough tenacity, anything is possible. That's what I've learned as a cosplayer. Uh, and now, before we get started, I do want to talk a little bit about the costume. Uh, I don't cosplay much, and when I do, it's usually Metal Gear characters. And I quickly realize why. It's much more practical. You have Now I've got the fake teeth, I've got to paint my hair, I've got to put the ears in. And like, Fuck this, you know, I'm, I prefer the military stuff. But yeah, so this was a really cheap, shitty pirate shirt that I got on eBay. Very plastic. Uh, I, I, you can do a flame test. You, you, you put your fabric under a light, over a lighter and just see how the fabric reacts. And yeah, this turned to plastic. It just melted into a sheet of plastic. Lovely and soft and breathable, though. So I don't know. Normally I try to avoid synthetic materials. But yeah, so I had to uh, actually do this hem. I'll get right up in there do the hem properly because it was just overlocked they hadn't actually rolled it or anything so yeah and uh you know as a furniture upholster i really really needed these seams to just be dead on straight it was very important to show my skills as a furniture upholster uh and then i so this is a 18th century shirt even though Baldur's Gate 3 is not set in any real time period they're clearly drawing from that time period so you know i had to i had to as a uh a student and practitioner of costume, you know. Uh, I did two years of war, but guys, I gotta live up to my standards. Um, yeah, so I made it correctly accurate. I'm just, I think my, yeah, because I pulled into my trousers, it's not twisting around correctly. We'll get this right. Give me a second. Yeah. So, yeah, added this plate. So there was a, you know, frilly cuff there, 
which never existed in in history, other than um, those frills are add-on cuffs. They were not attached to the shirts. So this is how the shirts in the 18th and 19th centuries looked. Uh, so yeah, I just added a placket there and then a fairly long cuff. And I was surprised to see, because I was looking at historical records, or maybe I'll show you a photo for comparison. Yeah, the cuffs are quite long. But there's only one button there, and I chose a nice fancy pearl gold looking one, though they didn't normally do them that fancy. Um, my main impetus for cosplaying as a star, and honestly, it's just that my hair kind of looks the same, it's just that mine's black and his is white. So, yeah, I just painted it. It hasn't gone fully white, it's just grey, but hey, it's bloody good enough. So, the impetus for this episode. Uh, yeah, I've just been musing for a while about fan fiction, fiction, imagination, and, and gender and sexuality and erotica and all of these things that teenage girls are consuming. And no one seems to notice. It kind of flies under the radar because teenage boys are quite uh, unsubtle about their interest in pornography. We all know about the porn hubs and the OnlyFans and the what have you. But what are teenage girls getting up to? And I think for the most part, society and parents have no idea. And this fan fiction, it's erotic. It gets quite erotic. It gets quite graphic. It gets intense. I have I've read some as research. I did not take any joy out of it, let me tell you. It's fucked up. <laughs> the, the real inciting incident, the motivator for this episode for me, though, was this disturbing trend amongst teenagers and young adults in regards to the way they engage with fiction. I realized, and this was a thing I would observe all the time when I was on Tumblr as a teenager and in my early 20s, but just didn't think that much about it. It was really bizarre that... No longer are these kids just innocently enjoying these stories, idolizing the characters, even lusting after the characters. But no, it's become very political, very narcissistic, and, and it's a sexually aggressive arena as well. I mean, just get a load of these pictures I found on Tumblr. It's, it's, that's disturbing to me. Am I the only one? And this is what I wanted to share. This is... I, I went off on... My stories on Instagram about it. So sorry, there's text on them. I have lost the the source of the originals for most of them. But yeah, I just I have to make a whole video on this because this is really fucked. And I saw this all the time when I was in this community. And uh, I mean, maybe I was guilty of doing the same thing. Of oh, what if this character was secretly trans or autistic or well, these other kids, you know, they're black or they're fat. There's weird agendas. Um, Actually, talking about Baldur's Gate, oh, there's another character, Halson. Very jacked dude, as you can see. Most of the fan art is accurate, making him look majestic and muscular and, and all that. Some of the fan art, I won't share it, but it, it's just they want to make more... Well, he transforms into a bear, but no, they want him to be the other kind of bear. So they, uh, yeah, they, they, they draw him overweight. Okay, so why... Weird, so you're not really attracted to the character for what he is. You want a fat version of that character. What the fuck? This is real weird. This is, this is a kink? I don't care. But anyway, getting to these aforementioned images. So I'll just uh, start with this one. Of uh, So this is Kim Kitsuragi from the game. Very good game, by the way. Disco Elysium. And the fandom of Disco Elysium is fucked. It's disgusting. I hate them. And, I mean, maybe not all of them, but the most vocal ones. Because they... I mean, it's now it's flooded my Pinterest. Because I like some of the art for... Well, the official art and fan art for Disco Elysium. But the, uh, there's just, now my feed is just full of, of gay porn, essentially. Just or erotic art uh, of the main characters, uh, the lead characters, Harry and Kim. Not Harry Kim from Star Trek. That's what I that's what I thought first. But yeah, so <clears throat> here's one where a girl is basically projecting herself onto this character of Kim. Uh, and she's thinking, oh, what if HRT does the opposite of what I want? What if I don't get a jawline? And then I'm going to start going bold. I mean, then what will I look like? 
unisex probably. I'd be short, glasses wearing, half Asian French guy with a small chin and a receding hairline and a pencil mustache. <gasps> I'm sorry. I'm sorry for everything I've ever said uh, to Kim Kitsuragi. Because he's, you know, uh... I don't even think he is androgynous. I think he just looks like a regular Asian man to me. I don't know. I mean, look, Asian men already have enough to deal with towards their self-esteem and, and ego on the dating apps, in the media. So, um, yeah, this is not helping. Just, oh, yeah, no, the fans of this character don't consider him manly either. Um, okay. I think he's just a regular-looking Asian man. I don't know. <laughs> um, now, next, we have... Oh, this one makes me want to be sick. No, actually, they all kind of make me want to be sick. I can't decide. So here we have the characters of MGSV, The Phantom Pain. Whoa! So, uh, this is what a trans-identified little girl has... Created, you know it's a kid, and you know it's a girl. You can, I can, I can tell just the fan art. I can tell the fan art done by a man or a woman. It is very obvious. So <clears throat> we have here Venom Snake. Uh, he's got a T-shirt with the rainbow colors saying, "Don't make me use my daddy voice." I hate the daddy and the mummy thing. Why? Why are we saying that now? It's gross. Uh, it's just that kids will think someone over the age of 25 is a DILF or a MILF. Unless they have children. Shut up. And also don't sexualize that. Just stop, please. Oh, that's the other thing, too. They are sexualizing Astarian, who is a character who has a lot of sexual trauma. He was basically a prostitute for 200 years. He was forced to do that for 200 years against his will. And so what do the fangirls do? They draw a lot of slutty, erotic art of this man. And I think you missed the point of this game? Maybe. So anyway, getting back to... Oh, this is so much, guys. So much. And I've been away for a while. Anyway, so Venom Snake. Uh, and the medic. So that's a spoiler. We won't get... Um, doesn't quite understand, but is respectful and supportive nonetheless. Medic understood his sexuality well, frequented gay bars, but as Venom Snake forgot and fears identifying himself. He is homo-romantic, grey asexual slash questioning. He, they pronouns. Did we play the same game? Did we... I just, this, is, this was driven me nuts about fan fiction, or fan culture in general, since the beginning, is that people can be so obsessed with this game or this TV show or whatever. And you get to, into a discussion with them and they have absorbed nothing. They do not understand the basics. They'll claim they're an expert, but no, they've sort of cherry-picked the things they like and just honed in on that. So when it comes to the men in the... I can talk to the MGSV, the Metal Gear fandom in general. The Metal Gear fandom is mostly male-dominated, especially on Reddit, and what they focus on is their achievements in the game, or mods, or just the technical or the logistical aspects of this game. They're much more focused on the mechanics of actually playing the game, uh, which is quite typical. You know, men uh, gravitate more to things, girls, gravi women gravitate more towards people, and so Metal Gear is no diff different, especially with MGSV, which you have these, you've got three complex, compelling, beautiful men as the leads. And so, as you can imagine, there's a lot of gay fan fiction about them. And I'll get into that more in a minute, but let's get through this. But yeah, how did you play this game, which has none of this in it, but you're projecting, oh yeah, no, Venom Saint must be gay. He doesn't really... I mean, he has a romance with a woman. You can choose to. But if he does have a romance, it is with a woman. So he, he's not... Uh, uh, Grey asexual, I, I did a short on that. That's a fucking bullshit term anyway. Uh, and the he, he, they, pro, the they pronouns. Everyone has they pronouns. So maybe he's gay because Quiet, who is a woman, a very attractive woman in the game, uh, 
kid writes my wife crosses her got on estrogen when she joined diamond dogs thanks to venom snake he is proud of her transition pan and trans and so he's gay because he's with a trap or he he created a tra- this venom snake in the, the version of this game that this girl has played in her mind not the masterwork by Hideo Kojima. Yes, I know it wasn't finished and Konami interrupted, but what we got is good. Guys, shut up. Shh. It's perfect. It's perfect. Anyway. <laughs> so in this version this girl is playing, she uh, has imagined Quiet was originally a man. So I'm just trying to imagine... So she transitioned and got an estrogen once she joined Diamond Dog. So she's out in the wild. He. So now it's a he. Quiet is a he. He's a man. Uh, wearing like a, the the bikini with a little g string bikini. How do you tuck? Or does he not have a dick anymore? I've got a lot of questions about this. I mean, all these characters are drenched in the rainbow flag, obviously. But yeah, so so Venom Snake gay because normally he would just be straight because he's with Quiet, but now Quiet's a man. So I see, I see. There's some internal logic here. Um, so the pansexual. Pansexual is another label that's just complete utter bullshit. Pansexual means you're attracted to anyone or anything. And being pan is good because you accept everything. You don't have any boundaries. Your orientation, your personal preferences, what you're comfortable with does not matter. You have to accept everyone. And if you don't, that's transphobic. So yeah, this kid's been drinking the Kool-Aid. And then uh, Huey... Uh, claims to be an ally for brownie points, but actively berates and verbally abuses his gay son. Okay, I don't even know if those characters are even seen on screen together. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just drawn this very exaggerated version of Huey, who is a dickhead, honestly. I'm, I'm fine with them making fun of him, because he's supposed to, he's not supposed to like him. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, boss, I didn't know, uh, that blank blank or blank blank was a slur i am an ally i i don't know i swear it's just so hard keeping track of pronouns you get it right no so this is interesting that so she's when she's using rhetoric that makes this person so bad and evil well it's actually quite sensible that yeah you, there are a lot of people who are allies, and they'll say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you aren't supposed to say those words." Or I, we've we've changed terms. That used to be okay. Now it's not okay. Oh, I meant well. Uh, it's hard to keep track. That's quite a sensible. Uh, this guy doesn't seem like he's actually transphobic or, or hateful, actually. <laughs> Woo! Oh, and then she just writes, "Ew." Her, her next point on why Huey is bad. Ew. Not wrong. Okay, so Big Boss. Um, I don't know what the shirt says. I'm really trying. Uh, sorry, girls. Something bananas? I don't know what that means. I, and it's a rainbow banana. I... So Big Boss has no concept of sexuality, sex, or gender... I mean, I've played the games. He definitely figures it out by the end of Snake Eater. <laughs> Would wear those god-awful Walmart Pride shirts unironically, not because he understands them, but because he genuinely thinks they look good. Bisexual. MB, um, oh, maybe aromantic, but a, a ro- arrows are cool, so... I, what the fuck? No, I mean, in the game, you in the games, you get to know the man quite well, and he does not own any clothes other than military clothing. I, I, I literally do not think he owns or ever wore clothing that was not military issue, even when he was in a private army. He's never wearing just a, a, a Walmart shirt. <laughs> I don't. Th- I mean, Walmart didn't exist then. I don't know when Walmart started, but I don't think it was in the sixties or to the sixties to eighties, which is the version they've drawn here. Um, and also, 
he wouldn't have weird slogans on his shirt, and I just you throw you you're projecting so much onto this character. It's not even the character anymore. You you like the look of, and this is what I've realized is with a lot of the fan on the fan fiction. There's no real reverence for the character, and I'll talk about that. The history of fan fiction. We'll get to that next. But there's no reverence for these characters. It is not pastiche. It is not a loving. A love letter to this story. It's he's hot and he's hot and they should kiss. And what if they were also a romantic, asexual band, pan by whatever the fuck? Because they're not really engaging with the stories in front of them. They are projecting everything outward, which must affect their life in a lot of critical ways. And you know, I'll say all this fantasy stuff. You you might think, oh, you know, these kids are just retreating into these fantasy worlds, and it's not good for you. But everything I've read on studies on fantasy, fiction, play, those are very crucial things for childhood development, and maybe by extension, teen development, that allows you to be more empathetic and imagine life as someone else, and get into their head, and yeah, take on those different roles. But we're not we're not seeing that when these kids are playing these games and engaging with these stories and these characters, they are just writing their own story on top of them. So, oh, this character is attractive. I'm going to write a story that I like that's about me on this attractive person that I wish I was. And that's the state we're in now. It is just so narcissistic. Now, here, this is, it just gets worse. I don't. Uh, here's a binderless trans venom I drew to feel better about myself, me, the most important person in the fucking universe. Uh, and this is discussed in Abigail Schreer's latest book, Bad Therapy. Um, and also in her previous very good book, Irreversible Damage, which is about the whole trans-industrial complex here. And that kids are not being raised in this collective mindset, even in these... Well, we're, we're in an individual's culture in, in the West, but it is getting much worse, especially in the United States, although as an Australian, I'm noticing it's happening here as well, that these kids are being raised with the tablets, the iPads, right up in their face. They're medicated. It's all about your feelings and not being taught you're part of a community. And, and thinking outwards, and especially when kids enter their teen years, they become very navel gazy. They think very intensely about, oh, do I fit in? Oh, I'm so weird, and I, I'm such a freak, and no one will ever understand. These are normal, but we're not teaching kids that these things are normal. So you get to this stage where uh, instead of this teenage girl just accepting, okay, I, I feel awkward in my body, I hate dealing with all of these changes, she's taking... Venom Snake, a, a beautiful man, a most perfect manly man. I mean, look. I mean, I'm a lesbian, but he's pretty impressive. I would... I maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you know, he, he's the quintessential, ideal masculine form. Um, but now this girl has defaced to face that perfect body, given it the big floppy windsock titties that you get when you're on testosterone, and you've got big tits and just go flat. Um, and I mean, the proportions are all weird, but I think it's more to do with the artist's skills, but maybe she is just subconsciously going for more of a feminine proportions. But yeah, I mean, this is. It's just to make herself feel better. So it's just, I wish I was... It's almost the, the visual manifestation. I really wanted to be Venom Snake, and I failed in that pursuit because I was lied to by my doctors. So now here is me trying to make myself feel better, going, but what if? What if, though? Venom Snake was also a failed transition project. <laughs> okay, this one I include because... Just the normalization or making these things more common, the, the these medical or pathological terms of oh, everyone autistic and ADHD and all, all that. So, yeah, we've got um, Venom Snake, autistic girl swag. 
I, 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 I'm too old to break that one apart, guys. I, it's beyond me. Uh, just pointing to Ocelot and calling him a whore. Why? But yeah, they, they're injecting a lot of their politics and and their own beliefs and, and worldview onto these stories. Instead of a story should be an amazing thing that opens you up to a whole new a whole new world, a new perspective. Not so with these kids. Oh, and here is a final one. I'll read directly from my stories posts because uh, it's I, I feel it's still correct. This is a particularly gruesome one. A revolver ocelot, a man drawn here as a trans-identified female with self-harm scars. This generation is deeply unwell. It makes me sad. They're not engaging with these stories and characters at all. They're warping everything to fit their ideology. Yeah. So the fact that you're making these characters deformed and sick like you. Uh, aren't stories supposed to be where you... It's an escape. It's this idealized fantasy. Shouldn't it be? Well, you imagine you are Venom Snake or the Hero Miller or Revolver Ocelot. And these are these strong, capable soldiers. Don't you want that fantasy? No, you, you kind of like the way those characters look. You pluck them out of their context and then you turn them into trans-identified women. Because you cannot relate to anyone or anything that is not like you. In my auto-androphilia video, one of my more recent ones, I spoke about how Transitioning comes down to, the desire to transition comes down to two factors, although I should add, I, I've decided I'm going to add three. So there's three factors. You're either gay, and so you want to be the opposite sex to maximize, tranny maxing, tr maximize your chances of finding a partner because, well, most people are straight. So if you could be straight, no worries. You are an auto heterosexual it's a fetish so you are either an auto androphile you're turned on by the idea of being a man or an auto gynophile you're turned on by the idea of being a woman and finally you're autistic i think that that definitely bears mentioning and why i didn't include it previously is a there wasn't much scientific literature on it and all the books about auto heterosexuality don't but no, I mean, just from observation, I know most of these people are autistic because they have very rigid ideas. They have trouble conforming to society's rules, but they also have very rigid and stereotypical ideas of those rules. They're very inflexible. Um, and I mean, I used to be autistic myself, long story there, time to do an update video about that. But I had some sort of metabolic issue, food allergies, whatever it is, In food intolerances, yeah. And that is the reason why I had the symptoms of autism, but it went away. You know, the, the sensory and social and all of those issues went away, and that's why I ended up detransitioning. But, yeah, I think it was a big factor in why I wanted to transition in the first place. Although I think also being gay and also it's a bit of a fetish, I, I kind of, I'm on the Venn diagram, I've kind of been in all of the states. Um, but I will say, it's not just the kids who have generated this issue by themselves, this narcissistic, highly political way of consuming fiction. Because, I'm going to steal a term from Red Letter Media here, it's passive progressive. So you're seeing a lot of remakes, you're seeing a lot of uh, adaptations, what have you, of known stories. But now, oh, there's a black woman, or there's, there's a whole female cast, or it's a, whatever, you know, they've flipped it to be more woke. And it's passive-progressive, because they are not giving us new original material. It is not really empowering the minority that it is depicting. It is tokenism. It's pure tokenism. And we used to not like tokenism back in the day, but now tokenism's great. We should worship these half-developed projects and characters. So this is why... I mean, it kind of protects them. It protects the studios because, well, if you don't like our latest Little Mermaid, what's wrong with you? You're racist. You don't like the Ghostbusters remake with women? You're sexist. So, yeah, they're, they're capitalizing on it. And these people, these left-wing, mostly young people, eat it up. 
thankfully, the general public doesn't care. The that, that Harry Potter game, even though J.K. Rowling is so evil and a monster, you know, the fandom's twisting itself in knots. Most people, a lot of people bought that game. A lot of people bought that game, played that game, loved that game. It is a perfectly fine game. I mean, I don't... Look, I'm not a pedophile, so I don't like watching or playing games that just involve children. Each to their own, I suppose. So now we've established that foundation. Let's get to the history of fan fiction. I would argue that fan fiction is as old as fiction itself. People shared stories around the campfire, about gods and heroes, legends and fairy tales. Then the listeners would go on to retell and embellish those tales. That is a kind of fan fiction. The teller is adding details they find interesting. And I generally, what they find interesting is not, you know, about their political or social uh, or their sexual identity. But yes, even Shakespeare wrote fan fiction. Romeo and Juliet, Much Ado About Nothing, and Othello, and As You Like It, and Winter's Tale. They're all based on someone else's ideas, concepts, characters. It's debatable when copyright law truly began. We see versions of it throughout antiquity, but the Statute of Anne from 1710 was the first official government statute to protect copyright law. So about a century after Shakespeare's death, we see a changing attitude towards fan fiction. In the 19th century, we see examples of unofficial sequels to the works of Jane Austen and Arthur Conan Doyle, to name a few. J.M. Barry, author of Peter Pan, even wrote his own Sherlock Holmes fanfic. The fanfiction of this era was mostly written as pastiche, that is to say stories were respectful in paying homage to the source material. There was an attempt to carry on the story in a plausible way. Now, many might be familiar with Star Trek being the grandfather of modern fanfiction. It was Star Trek that defined the shape of the modern fan culture overall. I mean, we would not have conventions without them. And it was through those conventions these authors had a place to distribute their fanzines under the counter. I've never read the stories produced from this era. I'm not sure copies still remain, but general consensus from extant records is that these stories were largely female written and many stories were fixated on a homosexual romance between Kirk and Spock. Spurk. Spork, if you will. <laughs> Star Trek would also give us the term Mary Sue, a trope referring to an obvious self-insert character who is impossibly perfect. And I think the Mary Sue, or the protagonist of a romance, she, we can point some blame to as to how this all flipped to this weird gay erotica and women wanting to be men. This is, this is the beginning of the end. This is the downfall. To quote Helen Joyce here, Mary Sue is the youngest lieutenant in Starfleet, aged 15 and a half. Kirk is spitten by her. Spock admires her brilliant mind. She frees the senior officers from an alien prison and runs the ship when other crew members fall ill. After receiving the Nobel Prize and Vulcan Order of Gallantry, she dies. To be mourned by all. Such transparent adolescent wish fulfillment is embarrassing to read and gave all self-insert fic a bad name. And... That is probably the point where things move from pastiche, homage, to erotica, or romance. The barrier of entry suddenly dropped significantly in the 1960s. Writing and printing and sharing stories was a lot harder in the 19th century. So there was far more consideration put into these works. They had to go through official channels of publishing and distribution. Unless one is willing to write a copy or copies by hand and share it amongst friends, one's options were limited. And um, actually, in the very early days of books of literature, that's really how it was. People just had to write multiple copies of a thing by hand and share it amongst friends. And so you know, have, maybe there were three copies of this. We know this book existed because there's other records of this book, but it no longer exists because well, there's three copies 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Good luck. So the means of publishing would come completely change in the 20th century. With the advent of typewriters and photocopy machines, anyone could set themselves up as an editor of a fanzine. This meant that the content would be as explicit as they liked without fear of censorship. And let's face it, humans are horny. We all like sex, we like talking about it, writing about it, watching it, 
playing video games where you romance the characters. Adding to this, the fact that women rarely had an outlet to explore their sexuality. But you had the magazines, the pornographic videos, strip clubs, you name it. Men's sexuality has always been right out there in the public. But women, not so much. I mean, to the point, I've read uh, the, the writings of sexologist Betty Dodson. She's wonderful, amazing. Uh, I would have loved to have met her. And I mean, she talks about how often she has these clients. She, she teaches them to get in touch with their sexuality. So many women who barely even look at their genitals and touch their genitals. Um, you know, they just, well, the husband plows them every night. They don't even know about their clitoris. They don't know the joy of sex. And so that's the environment that all of this is stemming from. Even today, we've kind of gone from one extreme to the other where these girls, and you're seeing this in the fan fiction as well, that a lot of this graphic, violent behavior that they're seeing in porn, and they shouldn't be watching porn, but as soon as you guys are watching porn, so there's the choking and the hitting and the spitting and the all that. You know, all the stuff made for the male gaze, that is not about female pleasure. And so what you're seeing is this really warped view. This is nothing new, but for most of history, women are giving a good intrication on their sex drive, on their bodies. So, and I've mentioned this in some other videos, that for the longest time, a woman's education about sex was on her wedding night. So, you know, I, I love you, we're married, oh, let me get your wedding dress off. Anyway, so by the way, this is a penis. Don't know if you've ever seen one before. <laughs> you know, imagine that. So, it is too late to back out. You cannot back out now. Um, oh, that's, that sounds like a nightmare. Uh, but boys, or well, a lot of them, I mean, it was normal. And this is in the 19th century. You would take your son to a brothel so that he could get experience. This professional woman can teach your son how to have sex the correct way it's for his wife, you see. For his wife. Now, he's really... Because women don't really know need to know how to do it. Just starfish. Just lie there. You're a hole. Another hole? Whichever. You, you're a series of holes. Sometimes babies come out of them. That is all. Your pleasure does not factor in. I mean, there is, you know, the Kama Sutra, and there are older texts that have some more awareness. Although the Kama Sutra, by the way, not always about sex. Not all about sex. It's like a little bit about sex. Um, but yes, I mean, for women, mostly, you had the old Mills and Boone. I'm surprised Mills and Boone is still going, but you got those romance novels. And that's really their only outlet. Until fan fiction. But then comes along Star Trek with these handsome, compelling male leads. And they seem to have very intimate friendships with each other. So, of course, you want to know more. Well, there isn't any more content, so better get writing. And there's perhaps two likely reasons women gravitate towards slash fiction. One is that compelling female characters are few and far between, even to this day. Women weren't exactly jumping at the chance to write about a or Nurse Chapel when they hardly got anything to do on screen. Why would you care? And so your alternative was to write a Mary Sue, which was never popular, and it's very hard to write a compelling original heroine who isn't just an extension of the author's ego, or just kind of a placeholder. You got Bella Swan in Twilight, you got whatever her name is in Fifty Shades of Grey. These women are just placeholders. The generic brunette, white woman, shy, timid, their only hobby is reading, really. They're passive. They're very passive women or girls. And that's by intention, so that you can project yourself. You, the reader, can project yourself onto her. Because if she has too much personality, if she has too much of a will, then it's harder for you to connect. So it, the, the most important thing is the male lead. He has to be sexy and compelling. Oh, you really want to be with him. So but the woman doesn't really matter. It's not interesting at all. And I mean, I I would argue, I why can't we have both? Very rarely do you see women being the most compelling part of a fictional romance. A woman is usually the gift that the hero gets at the end of the quest. Especially in 80s movies, you've got these stupid teenage boys, your main character, and there's a really hot girl, 
and oh, you, you gotta defeat the bad guy, the bully. You gotta win the karate tournament. Then you get this girl who really is so much better than you. You don't deserve, but you know it's the wish fulfillment, and that's how it is. It's just she's a pretty girl. Of course, you don't care about her, and so that affects girls and women. That they start to think hmm, maybe being a woman's kind of shit. Every women aren't as interesting. And that reminds me of this article I read once of... She's a screenwriter and an actress, uh, Lee Chapman. And she was in Man From U.N.C.L.E. And in this, e in this article, it, it stuck with me. I saved it because I... It's so true. My alter ego is male, she says. It is a credo vital to her writing as well as her personal life. I decided early on that guys got to have all the fun. Women don't interest me. And it's a very normal response when you see passive women in the media. You see passive women as a result in society. We're not... <laughs> we are capable of so much more than this, but... This is why girls become obsessed with these male characters. It, fiction and fandom is all about worshipping men. It's all about men. All the way down. Or objectifying women. And no wonder these kids come to this conclusion. So writing stories exclusively focused on male characters makes total sense. It's easier and more exciting. I mean, Kirk and Spock, these characters were really well defined. And McCoy as well. Really well defined, have a lot of personality, pathos. There's a lot to write about. There's, there's a lot to inspire you and we want to explore and get into the depth of those minds. The second reason why slash fan fiction became popular might be the same reason that men enjoy lesbian porn even though it has nothing to do with real lesbians it yeah i i've watched it and i just go this is gross these are clearly very straight women pretending to be gay they have long fingernails they've got the hair and the makeup and the fake titties and all this shit yeah, that's not. it does not appeal to the female gays at all. If you want to know what the female gays is like, go watch Love Lies Bleeding. That's the best lesbian love story ever, honestly. And that's how women see other women. But lesbian porn is how men see women. And they, they, well, yeah, they're obviously not watching it because they, they want a realistic look into the, the lives of lesbian women. No, they want to look at two hot women instead of looking at a dude. Why, why is a dude in the mix getting in the way i mean to the point that actually a, a mate of mine called heterosexual porn bisexual points so, well, i was just kind of curious if it did anything for me actually i've had a couple of mates who said that and they went oh you know what well, I, I was just looking at the woman the whole time yeah mate that's not bisexual porn that was normal porn for a long time if you look at <laughs> I don't know why the first thing that pops into my mind, but there was a Miami Vice porn parody back in the 80s, because of course. And it's got the men, but obviously it's, it's for men to look at the women, and the camera's not really focused on the men. But anyway. <laughs> so why would women want to write fan fiction about two men? Well, obviously you are interested in these men, even though it's written. That's because it's all about the psychology and what it feels like. So, well, you, you love Big Boss and Ocelot. They're very attractive men. You want to see them get together. Two for, the, you know, two birds, one stone, two for the price of one. Everyone wins, right? <laughs> Either the gay fan fiction or the lesbian porn has nothing to do with the real experience of, of gay sex. Uh, a lot of gays find it laughable. Um, and I've been trying to find... Back in the day, these were ever... I'm trying to find... All these articles gay men would write, it's like, if you want to write a believable gay erotica fanfic, here's how you do it. Uh, and, well, the, the ones I can find, or the anecdotes, are just the comments here and there, they're saying, well, the weird things about gay fanfiction or the gay romances aimed at women in the manga and all that is... These men act like women. They have the same concerns as women. They talk like women. And they have sex like women. And also how women... So the Fujoshi. Okay. Fujoshi is this Japanese term 
rotten girls, the literal translation. They're these girls who have this fixation on gay romance. They, they like the slash fiction, they like the, the gay manga and all that. And, but they're not really men. That's the thing, is they're not, A, obsessing over very masculine men, but B, those men don't, men, don't act like men. Um, and so, in a weird way, it's all lesbian erotica, but in the disguise of being gay erotica. <laughs> So, you know, you got Draco Malfoy and Harry Potter or whatever. Again, why are you writing about children, you pedophiles? But these are adolescent boys, these beautiful young boys that look like girls. And so you put them in these erotic relationships. And so you're basically writing your own lesbian story here. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> because these characters will talk and relate and, and have sex like a woman does. So, yeah, uh, the next section is my experiences with all of this. Uh, so, I'm never big into fan fiction, but it was always around. It's always the, it's in your peripheral. Uh, I was a big reader as a kid of, of fictional books. I went through so many books as a, as a kid, and then once I hit my teen years, I, was just, I don't want to read at all. I have no interest whatsoever. I just spent all my time on Scans Daily, which was... This online community on LiveJournal, it's probably moved around now, it was on LiveJournal and it was about, it was just little scans, little clips, cutouts of comic books. And that's how I got interested in comic books as a teenager. But a lot of it went to homosexual territory for some reason. I was being groomed. You know, it all starts there, I think, with Scans Daily where, oh, I, I like looking at the funny Deadpool comics or whatever and then but around that is this community that was very fujoshi and that was very was women who were very obsessed with gay relationships between these characters who are not gay in the source material and it's interesting though canonical gay characters in fiction do not get that attention and they have to make the straight characters gay because Clearly, then... Well, okay, the gay characters are generally not the main characters. They tend to be side characters. But I think that's not the main issue. The main issue is just that these girls are not interested in what a real gay relationship looks like. They, they want this fantasy. But yeah, so I'm, I'm reading Scans Daily, and then they do share fan fiction on there, and I would look at them, and even the erotic ones, and go, what the fuck? I would just laugh at it. I thought it was really silly. I didn't take it seriously at all. And, and even to this day, I will look up certain pairings, really unlikely pairings on Archive of Our Own. That's AO3. That's where all the fanfic is now. Back in my day, it was fanfiction.net. Is that around anymore? I don't know. But, but yeah, it, it is still funny to just look up. Very unlikely pairings, and then seeing someone's written about it. Like, okay. Smithers and Mr. Burns have fan fiction. <laughs> uh, and then I migrated across as I got older to Tumblr. Tumblr came about, and so I migrated across to there. And again, you have this community of male worship and homoerotic fixation. And then you also get the trans stuff leaking in too. So you're told, oh, gay male relationships are the pinnacle of relationships. They're the most amazing, most erotic, sexiest thing in the world. And then you just, yeah, you're just being groomed. You, I, there's no centralized grooming going on. There is no one person saying, I am the leader of this cult and you must transition. But it's just this, who is, it's like a psyop. It is a psychological operation putting these ideas in our heads. Um, and I have written my own fan fictions. Uh, I am Jackson Velour on Archive of Our Own, if you want to check that out. Uh, and I, I did enjoy writing fan fiction in my free time, when I had free time. Uh, that's why I haven't made a video in so long. I'm living in, I'm sharing with, with a friend of mine, thank God, but it is two hours, 90 minutes to two hours to get to work. So I might do a six-hour shift, but then I'd have a four-hour commute on top of that. So I just... Everything I used to do, making videos, making costumes, gone out the window. I have no time for anything. 
maybe one day there won't be a housing crisis and I can actually move closer to work. I like my job. I, I do. And seamstress jobs are few and far between, let me tell you. But yes, getting back to my fanfiction history, I had a totally different approach. I was a bit more old school when it came to my writing. A, it was to practice writing. I wanted to learn how to write fiction, and I, I have learned a lot. I think it's really greatly enhanced my ability to write and tell a, a well-plotted story with good characters. But it was never... I mean, there are erotic elements. You, you have a sex scene here and then, just like most more movies, TV shows do. But yeah, it wasn't that masturbatory, narcissistic thing. It just does not occur to me. I approach every, especially the full length fan fictions I've done, as a novelization. As if someone give, gave me this task of, look, we need a novelization for Star Trek Next Generation, or we need one for uh, Knight Rider. I, I wrote a Knight Rider fan fiction as well. Uh, so, yeah, I wrote one for Star Trek Next Generation about Timothy, a real character in the show that I imagined had been adopted by Data, and it was what I wanted to explore. is something much deeper than sex. It was about so what happens if Timothy had this body dysmorphia. This is around the time I'm thinking of detransitioning, so this was a real therapy session for me. But uh, it was called The Body Electric, and so Timothy is now an adult, but we cover how he struggled with this transhuman dysphoria. He never, he, you know, he, he really latched onto the idea of being a robot in his, the episode he was on. And so, well, what if he he just didn't get over that by the end of the episode? He had to struggle with that for years, and he he tried to fit in. He tried to make things work, and it wasn't that nothing really worked for him. And so he becomes a Borg. So the Borg are basically kind of this allegory for transitioning. He becomes a robot. He's finally a robot. Well, he's a cyborg. So even then, he becomes a cyborg. But he's going, there's still organic things inside me. There's still, there's still humanity. There's something organic. I can't ever fully be a robot. And so it's the same thing as you transition. You go, but, well, but there's all this and that. And I can't fully be a man. No matter what I do, I'll never fully be a man. So that was the whole allegory of that story. And it, well, I won't spoil the ending, but yeah, it's not a happy ending. He loses a lot. He he sacrifices a lot for what? Most recently, I wrote a Knight Rider fanfic that was structured as a kind of two-parter epic season five finale that we never got. Uh, and that was answering all my questions about uh, to the villain, Car. His name is Car. Where, where did he come from? Why was he developed? Why did he turn evil? Going into all the mor morality questions of an evil robot, evil AI, um, uh, and he falls in love, sort of. He has a weird romance with a teenage girl. She's like a high school cheerleader character. So, you know, I'm having fun. I'm having this. It's a pastiche to 80s culture, music, Knight Rider. So that's what I wanted to get out of that story. And then finally, and sadly, I had to abandon my Detroit Become Human fanfiction, which aimed to be more of an intellectual exploration of the themes of artificial life, and it was primarily focused on Carl and Kamsky and their philosophical debates made manifest. So it was definitely not what kids are normally writing about. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. It's fine for kids to explore their sexuality this is a great place to do it just writing fluff as they call it or hurt comfort is another very popular genre but they're just learning emotional connection so i don't i'm saying all this because i want to say fan fiction by itself is not inherently evil or a lesser form of art or anything like that i want to make that very clear but it goes without saying that most stories on Archive of Our Own and fanfiction.net are unsurprisingly erotic. To the point that the cliche is when you say, I read a fanfic or I wrote a fanfic, everyone else goes, oh, like that kind of. No, they don't always have to be like that. So it's about three reasons. I've kind of mentioned these before. It's easier to write sex and romance than it is to write a story with much more developed plot women don't have many outlets for their sexuality, and men are far more visual. So porn is aimed primarily at them. They simply need to see the act of sex, 
Women tend to be far more sensual and psychologically motivated. They want to read about romance, the experience, the sensations, the emotions. They also want an emotional connection with those characters. So, so reading fan fiction about Gale or Starion or any other freaking male character that you already have an emotional bond with, that's more compelling to them. Whereas watching pornography is not really of a, just complete strangers, just, you know, porn stars. That, that doesn't really do much for most girls or women. Uh, it's not the act that they want to see primarily. And again, this is just a stereotype. These are stereotypes. This is generally speaking, this is what men are like and this is what women are like. Stereotypes exist for a reason. And as a lesbian, I don't really see a space for myself in fandoms. There really is no lesbian spaces, or there's no story or game or whatever that is very popular amongst lesbians. It's all male-focused. And so no wonder a lot of lesbian girls out there feel confused, feel isolated, and, and don't really have a, a voice or a place where they feel accepted and so that they can actually enjoy these women they're attracted to and kind of get into that fan hype the way an Astarian fangirl could. There's no lack of, of content. You could be looking at Astarian all day, every day for a year and not run out. But, you know, basically what I want is well-written lesbian erotica written by women. You know, I don't want lesbian porn made by men. Or, you know, you look at the rule, rule 34 fan art. But usually the rule 34 fan art gets weird and the really fat or, or um, vor versions of, of these characters. Or furry versions of these characters. Just give me, like, a normal sexy image of this character. I, why do they have to look like a balloon of a Ruka Salt in Willy Wonka? I don't know. What, what is wrong with you? Why is this the most popular thing? Yes, yeah, so getting into this uh, Fujoshi and and kind of homophobic versions of these relationships, how these women approach gay relationships, is they're very obsessed with top and bottom. You know, who's topping, who's bottoming? So the Metal Gear fandom, the female fandom, bunch of Fujoshis. A mate of mine has read basically every Metal Gear fanfic. She's really into Metal Gear. So she shared them with me, and I, I mostly think they're just a bit of a laugh. I've, I've, I've read occasionally good non-sexual ones uh or even slightly sexual ones but yeah for the most part they are very violent erotic stories where big boss is almost always the top of course he's big boss he's the top so he's he's topping revolver also can go either way he's a triple agent you see so he, he can he can do whatever there's no canonical there's very little canonical romance in the Metal Gear games, but don't stop these girls. So then you have Kazuhiro Miller, my man Kazuhiro Miller, who is masculine, badass, a tenacious motherfucker. He is just a force of nature, and I love him. But what do these girls do? Oh, well, he's, he's soft and effeminate and weak. He's the bottom. He's always the bottom. He's just like a gay disaster. It's very reductive, and, and also I find it offensive. What, because he's disabled, or what? That they've decided, oh, he must be the the damsel in distress. He's always that character in these stories. So how can you call yourself a fan if you don't even know the basics of this character? You don't see him for what he is. But the grossest one, which was about Kazuhira, was it was, it was supposed to be a sex scene between Venom Snake and Kazuhira. And Venom Snake is looking at Kazuhira's body after the accident. So he's, he's lost the limbs, he's, he's recovered, and so they're making out. And there's a line about, oh, he's put on weight, he hasn't been able to exercise, and he's become soft like a woman. Ew. Ew, nasty. I, uh, 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 uh. Not a fan. <laughs> that is gross. It's unsexy. It's really unsexy. But I don't know why you would write that in erotica. That, that does something for you. But... It demonstrates what is going on in the psychology of these writers, that they, they're they writing to women, essentially. The women disguised as men. Hmm. Women disguised as men. Huh. And so maybe there is where 
that psychology warps and that trans ideology comes in because they're surrounded, they're just drowning in slash fiction. So they... But technically, accidentally, it's female-on-female romances because these characters are not acting like men. So these girls, and some of them may be lesbians. And they're just confused. So they want to present more masculine, their idea of masculine. You know, these demi-boys, these soft boys, all that thing. Uh, and, I mean, the tragedy is, if they're straight, that they will transition and have a much harder time finding the people they're attracted because they, they are attracted to straight men, to the straight men in these TV shows, their movies or games. So they want to find someone like that, like Venom Snake, like Kazuhiro. Uh, and so they become a man. They they become a man. They, they look like a boy. And so they want to get out there and find the man they're attracted to, only to realize gay men are not like that at all, and gay men are not interested in you at all. And so it's just a very shocking realization that this anime manga version of of their sexuality is fiction it's a complete lie how much fan fiction is written about the women in the story so quiet in metal gear the only canonical romance that venom snake has she does not get any erotic stories actually there are no erotic stories about quiet it is all just She's, she's tagged in these stories because she's mentioned because a lot of characters are mentioned briefly. Not that she's actually a character in it. Um, and you see this with Baldur's Gate as well. The female characters have the least amount of fan fiction, the least amount of erotic fan fiction as well. Again, as a lesbian, I'm going, well, but I want sexy Carl Act times. Do I not? I want some Lazelle. No. Together? Okay, Carla can Lazelle? No? No? Okay. So if I want those things, I have to go into the male part of the fandom, and then there's the weird Rule 34 stuff that gets all vor and, and what have you. And it's, So where do I go? I have nowhere. I've got to write my own, I guess. I, I very much recommend reading those Helen Joyce articles. She wrote two, so it was one many years ago just about fan fiction and, and female erotica in general didn't touch on well and she comments on this too in her second article she realized oh in hindsight i was really hinting at the trans ideology before i even knew about it or was aware of it and the how these two things intersected i mean i would argue and i have argued in this video there are a lot of aspects of this that are normal that are logical that have resulted from environment resources community and or the lack thereof and then also i'm going to make another argument here so there was maybe i'll put a headline here with some of the articles that said birth control causes women to want more or less masculine not more feminine but just less masculine men and i questioned that I, maybe there is a factor birth control is horrible it, it does not have a place in a woman's body it is toxic but, going for less masculine men, well, it depends where you are in your cycle. But secondly, it depends how old you are. Now, I grew up in the Lord of the Rings fandom. This is you know, back in 2002, 2003. And on the forums, we had specific forums. You remember forums? Forums were good. Now it's all Reddit. But... You be, the Council of Elrond and the One Ring dot net. Do you remember the anyway, going way back. But the women primarily were either in Camp Aragorn or Camp Legolas. I was Camp Legolas. Obviously I have a thing for the effeminate elf men. I, I have not changed. And in hindsight I'm looking at it now going, Oh right, because I, I was, you know, going through puberty, kind of confused, going, well, Legolas kind of does something for me. Not Will Turner, Orlando Bloom's character in Pirates of the Caribbean. Never looked at him that way. But I was fixated on Legolas, and I couldn't figure out... Actually, if you look just slightly to your left there, is Kate Blanchett. 
What was I saying? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a, a Catholic girl, by the way. So this confused tween-age lesbian Catholic girl. And so I had this huge fixation on Legolas. Although later it was Anakin. So I kind of went a little more butch, maybe. Um, but that, that, I think Anakin's more of my auto androphilia. That's when that was starting to kind of enter the picture. Because Natalie Portman's very fine. Sadly, she's a vegan, so I couldn't be in the same room. She'd stink. Looks very fine. <laughs> but, yeah, it was all the young women, the teenage girls, the young women, they loved Legolas. And then the the more sophisticated, refined lady, the older lady, she was into Aragorn. And I think that's just so demonstrative of how female sexuality works. For boys, it seems the transition from boy to man in terms of sexual attraction is purely down to you 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 grow up and you realize oh you can appreciate a woman for aspects other than oh she's hot. How big are her tits? How big is her ass? You know, those very superficial things. They go from superficial to going, well this woman ha it has my back. She is confident, she's capable. She you know, when a man actually gets into a relationship, he values things that are much more important than, is she hot? Uh, they're less visual. They're, they're able to think with the upstairs brain rather than just the downstairs brain. But for girls, there seems to be this transition. She, she doesn't immediately love the manly man. She has to start with someone a bit more androgynous, effeminate, someone they can relate to. Because, well, men generally, they're bigger, they're more powerful, they have hair all over their bodies, It's this and they smell weird, and they're, they're this very alien concept. So uh, for a young girl, you know, I'd, I can't imagine any tween age girl having, a, you know, a, a, a lumberjack looking guy on her posters in her room, you know. Uh, I mean, Tom Selleck, yeah, Tom Selleck, I think his fans were mostly an older audience, but the teenage girls, they, they loved the, the Beatles, David Bowie, Prince, all those guys, people who had a lot of, and still do, have a lot of female fans, especially young female fans, they weren't really, no, there was no birth control back in the 60s when the Beatles, the Beatle mania was happening, so it's just these teenage, teenage girls liking these pretty non-threatening boys. It has not changed. That is as old as time itself. But generally, culturally, a teenage girl is in high school. She's surrounded by teenage boys. She's just going to look at them as the most likely partners for her. And it's only later that she will broaden her taste or she'll feel more comfortable around men. Um, and then also this BDSM stuff becoming more mainstream. So you've seen all the BDSM happening in the porn. Boys and girls are looking at this, and they're thinking that's normal. And, oh, and it's at the point now where I'm on these dating apps and I'm talking to people, and they're saying, so, are you dominant or submissive? Or, you know, I, I, you know, and starting to talk about these dominant fantasies with me, and it's going, fuck off with that silly shit. We're just two people. We're equals. I haven't met you yet. Maybe those things can be fun to do one day. But, yeah, these kids are getting the complete wrong idea that... There's violence involved with sex. It's a dominant, dom, submissive thing. BDSM, uh, you know, gender stereotypes. It is. Just, I feel sorry for this generation, honestly. I mean, I'm just slightly before this generation, and I already had to sort through a lot of confusing shit. The kids, kids, I'm talking to you now. Teens, young adults, whatever you are, you're kids to me. I'm old. Arnie Courtney's gonna drop some advice on you. A real loving relationship is one of equality. Maybe your yin and yang are the complete opposite. But you're two halves of a whole. You complete that whole. And the idea that you have to be submissive or, or you should dominate your partner, that, that is not reality. That's fantasy. And BDSM is not a lifestyle. Generally, people don't do that 24-7. That is not their identity. And, and you're seeing that now. These kids are identifying as, oh, I'm either a dom or a sub or a bit of both. 
that is not how that works. That is not a, that's not your personality. That's the thing you might like to play around with sometimes. I, I've, I've, I've had people introduce themselves to me. Now, I'm a submissive or I'm a dominant. Ooh, I don't need to know. I just met you. Don't want to know what you do in the bedroom, but it is also not your permanent identity. It's just a thing you might like to do sometimes. My final thought in all of this is where did it come from? And this is what I was trying to explore with all this research. Is Where did it truly originate? And who can I blame? How did we get here? I would say it's just misogyny in the media. I honestly think that was that it, from a small thing, this huge thing blew out from that. Because you never know what the effect of, of something is, but if you are not seeing yourself represented in the media, representation matters. I won't argue that. But not bullshit made up ones where you take a straight character and make them gay, or take a thin character and make them fat, or a neurotypical one and make them autistic, or a cis- cisgender, a normal man and turn into a trans man or whatever the hell it is. I think if butch women and effeminate men were represented more in the media, they got to be the heroes. They got to actually have a big role and they were compelling. A lot of this would be avoided. And I'm not saying you've got to show them gay and lesbian characters, just butch, effeminate, gender non-conforming. This is so common that this trope has a name. Vasquez always dies, named after my Corazon. Vasquez from Aliens. She was the most butch. She was hot. She was great. Would have loved to see more of her. She's just, I'm looking at her now. She's very cool. Yeah. Anyway, what was I saying? Yeah, so uh, Starship Troopers is the same thing. There are so many. Uh, Michelle Rodriguez's characters, just every Michelle Rodriguez character usually. If you are not the prettiest, most feminine one, you're going to die. You are not going to have as much screen time. You are not going to get to be the main character. Uh, Michelle Rodriguez actually has a quote here. People can call it typecast, but I pigeon told myself. Saying no to the girlfriend, saying no to the girl that gets captured, and eventually, I just got left with the strong chick who always gets killed. Yeah. So that's why. It, it's media. It is just fiction. That we are not showing... I was not shown. I'm kind of pissed off about this. I mean, I'm always pissed off. This channel's been going for years. I've got a lot of things to be pissed off about. But if I had more Vasquez's, I had more Michelle Rodriguez's on screen, if I didn't feel so bad about wanting to be a bodybuilder and, and having those tendencies and desires as a teenage girl, I... Maybe I wouldn't have gone down this path. Where there's, there's a lot of other factors. Obviously, again, the channel's been going on for a while. There's a lot of factors that drove me to this point. But the fact that even now, as a 32-year-old woman, I struggle to come to terms with my own sexuality and my own body. Because when I play games, when I watch movies, when I engage in any kind of media, I am always subconsciously I'm kind of being hypnotized uh, or, or trained to fixate on the male characters. But man, it would have made a huge difference, huh? If I could look at lesbian fan fiction instead of just a bunch of gay fan fiction, where would I be now? Would I be dressed as a vampire elf talking to the internet? I don't know. But it's good to be back. Hopefully I can do this more often. Hopefully I'll cosplay as Gale at some point. It's a much more involved costume. Until next time, see you, Space Cowboy.